right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to another part of our series online here with the uh, Jonathan Dickinson State Park being in the news a lot lately. I uh, thought it was a Nicole had the great suggestion that we need to have some online presentations to help raise awareness of many aspects of the park that are important. And for me, that you know, that's the history, especially. Um, so I spoke yesterday about a general overview of the park, uh, especially 1947 to present and how it was, how it became a park, how it developed, um, became what it is today. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about the World War II era, uh, right before it became a state park with Camp Murphy, which was the Southern Signal Corps school during World War II. Um, everybody, please keep muted until we get to the Q&A at the end uh, and hold all your questions to the end, and I'll be happy to answer any questions people might have. And for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm the historian down here at the uh, Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse and Museum, which is also the Loxahatchee River Historical Society. So we are the local historical society for the Loxahatchee River region. Jupiter to quest of the whole Loxahatchee River watershed, which includes things like Camp Murphy. No. So first off, why is it the Southern Signal Corps School? They were originally just one Signal Corps school at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, uh, at the start of World War II. And during the war, because of the massive growth of the US military, that included setting up other Signal Corps schools for training. So Camp Murphy gets set up at, as the Southern Signal Corps School in Florida, radar maintenance, and later also some heavy signal construction battalions. Uh, the Officer Candidate School remains back in New Jersey at Fort Monmouth. There is a Midwestern or Central Signal Corps School sent out at Camp Crowder, uh, Missouri. When Murphy will close in the latter part of the war, a lot of the guys from Camp Murphy will be then sent to Crowder. Um, there's a Western Signal Corps school out in California, which is especially preparing guys for the challenges of the Pacific War climate. So what, and then what is radar? So Army Signal Corps started back during the American Civil War. Back then, they only have telegraphs and signal flags and some other uh, earlier communication technology. Uh, Heinrich Hertz, who is the guy that the Hertz, uh, the measurement of one of, one of the scientific measurements of uh, energy is uh, the one who shows that radar waves will bounce off solid objects, which is essentially the basis for radar. Uh, Marconi will patent radio communication. The Signal Corps will pick up on radio communication as another new form of communications technology. Um, 1919 is when the Signal Corps school moves to Fort Monmouth. Signal Corps uh, laboratories then start up to develop technology for the Army instead of having to just buy it from other outside civilian contractors uh, or other countries. And then it's the British who develop who demonstrate that radio detection and arranging of airplanes is a practical and useful technology. That's how we get radar from that acronym. Uh, the first US made radar developed by the Signal Corps is going to be something called the SCR 268, um, Signal Corps radio. Uh, there will be a lot of numbers. I'll not try to <laughs> use too many of them to confuse people. Um, but so this is, you know, 1940. This is right. World War II is already broken out in Europe. Uh, you know, this is right. And this, things are developing fast here and they have to. So how do we end up with Camp Murphy being chosen where it is? Uh, well, the first problem was obviously they need to grow. They don't have space for the Signal Corps School to all to stay at, just at Fort Monmouth. Uh, also, as was pointed out by Colonel Ord, who you'll hear about quite a bit in this presentation, Fort Monmouth was not the ideal place for men working on tall antenna structures in the winter. Uh, this area here between Jupiter and Hope Sound is ideal for a number of reasons. The topography is nice. It's rolling terrain that you can blend the camp buildings into that terrain so it's not real visible. Uh, there's a US Highway 1 right there on one side of the camp. There's the Florida East Coast Railroad running right through the middle of it, so you've got good access for uh, transportation. You have West Palm Beach and Stewart as decent-sized cities for support, R&R, things like that, but not too close. They'll provide a lot of snooping eyes. Uh, what's now Palm Beach International Airport at the time was the Army Air Force's Morrison Field. 
uh, and they're also constructing Boca Raton Field, uh, where the Florida Atlantic University main campus is today. So the Army also knows they'll have plenty of planes to track with their radar for training purposes. Um, and this terrain, uh, this territory between Hope Sound and Jupiter, there are a lot of property owners, but they're generally investors or a few farmers or ranchers. There's essentially nobody to evict, and there's very few locals to snoop on anybody. Uh, Jupiter Island is a small, essentially winter resident town uh, community for the most part. Hope Sound is a very small community, primarily agricultural. Jupiter, in the entire Jupiter area, in and out of uh, the municipal limits, well under a thousand people at the start of World War II. So there's not a lot of people to, to cause problems here. So uh, seems pretty ideal. And they act fast on this. Um, the establishment of a radar maintenance school is approved by the Secretary of War on January 19th, 1942. Five days later, uh, Major James Green, uh, I think he was then a captain, Ord, and a couple others uh, investigate a site in Hope Sound and with it will become the camp and report in favor of choosing that as, their, as the camp site for the Southern Signal Corps School. It is approved February 5th of 1942, and the, mil the federal government immediately starts eminent domaining the landowners, uh, getting some of the land that's owned by the state, uh, getting things set up you know, quick, as quickly as possible so they can have, they will approve the site in February, they will have it dedicated in July, uh, and with you know basically building pretty much everything from scratch. Um, this is a map that just gives you a general overview of how much the property was divided amongst little owners uh, at the time of 1942. And you'll notice that this outline is very similar to the outline for Jonathan Dickinson State Park today. That's not a coincidence. So construction will be handled, uh, acquisition of the property, and most of the work will be handled by the Army Corps of Engineers office in Jacksonville. Uh, they also create a topographic map of the area between US-1 and the FEC Railroad, where the vast majority of the infrastructure are going to be placed. Um, John Ord creates the camp layout and coordinates with the Corps of Engineers. A gentleman named McSpadden is the civilian area engineer for the project. Uh, Ord designs both a northern and southern layout of the camp with the hospital in the middle. Either one was potentially usable, and if the war got big enough, they could actually double the size of the camp. And the northern layout was the one that was chosen and used. Work is underway March through June. Uh, Ord describes the FEC Railroad as one of the most cooperative organizations we've dealt with. Uh, equipment is being stored at the Merchant and Miners Warehouse in Riviera Beach between April and June. Uh, and as the store in there preparing to ship up to the camp. Uh, there's also some preliminary training going on there at uh, the warehouse in Riviera Beach. Total construction cost for Camp Murphy is about $10 million. Used almost entirely standardized designs. Most of them are classified as temporary buildings. In fact, the barracks buildings will usually be bare tar paper without even siding put on the exteriors. Um, this is something done quickly, cheaply, um, to last the war, and we'll worry about afterwards if we need to. Uh, it will be expanded a little bit from the initial 1942 construction into 1943 when the camp hits its peak size. Uh, this photo here shows the dedication on July 5th, 1942. You can see the bare wooden walls there above this enormous flag, which this scene reminds me of something from the opening of Patton. Um, you can also see there on the stage, there is a CBS radio microphone. So, you know, they were... Ken Murphy was always about hiding what they were doing, but they did not necessarily, they did not really try to hide that they existed. The opening of the camp was big news in the Palm Beach Post and the Stewart News. You know, it was just the details were, were kept mum for secrecy. Radar is a, you know, highly classified technology at the time. Uh, this dedication is held in the Enlisted Service Club. Here is the first graduating class at Camp Murphy in the auditorium. Um, the building will, of course, then remain in use for the for the rest of the camp's life. Um, this is what that service club exterior looks like, one of the largest buildings on the uh, the camp. That's World War II Jeep there on the right. Um, the service, in addition to the service club, I mean, this is an extensive camp for at the peak of 
potentially 5,000 men. There are two chapels, there are two uh, post exchanges, PXs. Uh, there's a cafeteria plus various mess halls. There will be an officers club and a an, uh, non-commissioned officers NCOs club established. It's got a library, a bowling alley, billiards, pool tables. Uh, there's a movie theater with three shows daily. They have baseball teams and boxing events and football teams and swimming events. Um, there will be a military baseball league between Camp Murphy, Morrison Field, Boca Raton, the Coast Guard in West Palm Beach, um, occasionally the Coast Guard in Hope Sound and the Naval Radio Station in Jupiter, um, all supplying teams at various times. At one point, they will play some games against the local high school to get more competition options. Uh, they'll occasionally have kind of exhibition games against teams from Miami uh, or over there. The uh, team from, uh, I think it's Bucknell Field over in Fort Myers came over to play at least one exhibition game because uh, they had a former Major League Baseball player on their team. Photography is a technically prohibited on the site. There's some official Signal Corps photos, and then there are some unofficial photos, uh, like the one here of the service club. Uh, Colonel Ord took the only known color photography of the camp, and thank goodness he captured that bit of history. Uh, we also had a few people who were stationed there that also did a little incognito photography of uh, little slices of the life. Uh, a lot more photos that we have of people off base, you know, on Jupiter Island and, and visiting Stewart and West Palm Beach, uh, where photography was a lot more openly used. Uh, there's a noon alarm to synchronize watches and clocks. There's regular bus service established to Stewart and West Palm Beach from the camp. Uh, the two main gates, there's the, the main gate is the old camp, uh, old state park entrance. Um, that's now the middle entrance for the Jonathan Dickinson State Park these days. Very unassuming, used just by the park staff. Um, the modern gate to the state park is actually the, just was the hospital gate um, for the, when it was Camp Murphy days. Uh, those were both 24 seven gates with guard houses. Uh, the North gate on Old Dixie Highway, which run, ran along the east side of the railroad, it was closed for the camp. It's never reopened to the public because of the park after the war. Uh, South gate is open facing Jupiter, is open just 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. The North Gate is shut entirely for the war. Uh, they had some strict things on, you know, soldier behavior. Uh, there's no sick in quarters. You're either on duty or in the hospital. Uh, and soldiers were warned that they could potentially receive orders to ship out with less than 24 hours notice. Um, if you were, especially if you were a student here, uh, if you failed your test, too bad, so sad. You were you are on off to training elsewhere, being shipped up to be an infantryman. Uh, this was, you know, challenging training, so they needed to have very important, uh, they needed to have very sharp guys who are really on the ball about learning this stuff and, and working hard and putting in extra effort. Uh, there was a there was a study hour offered to help make sure people got stuff right, and it wasn't mandatory, but effectively it was mandatory. <laughs> um, the first graduating class that I showed there, uh, about 70 soldiers is the a layout of the camp. This is oriented with north to the top there. So you've got US-1 along the top side, railroad on the bottom side. You can see how each, the barracks areas were laid out by company. Um, there's a, the 801st Signal Training Regiment is the, where the students are going through. Um, much, very large <laughs> regiment in terms of uh, paper records because they've got all the way up to company, uh, you know, W and X. Uh, not all of those companies will be full strength at, at any given time. Now, essentially, they would be a company would be created almost like a, a class. And so you graduate or you fail, they're moved on. There's kind of a shell of a company for uh, administrative purposes until they cycle in another batch of students to fill that up. So uh, when you there's the one yearbook that is produced for Camp Murphy in, sometime in 1943, and you will see some very full companies and some companies that are like five people. <laughs> um, there's four wells for water. There are three cisterns, big concrete cisterns called water vaults. Uh, there's a sewer system uh, that a lot of underground uh, infrastructure is actually still there today. You'll see it if you wander around camp, uh, see the manhole covers. There's a water treatment plant over on the west side of the railroad. Uh, that's the kind of blocked off area at the bottom of this map toward the lower right. Uh, and the upper right where the hospital is, that is Pine Grove Campground today. Uh, you can see the officer course. There's a whole railroad siding there toward the 
left-hand side so they could pull off unload supplies, freight, um, coal for all the camp stoves and things like that. Um, Hobe Mountain Tower there is marked in red, so you get that little bit of orientation. So if you ever you know looked at all these roads and paved trails in Jonathan Dickinson State Park and you thought that they run in some strange ways, uh, they're all leftover from the camp, uh, oriented to kind of deal with the terrain and to you know reach the various areas. Uh, their camp has its own phone system. It has a chain link fence around the exterior, and then there's a second interior fence going around the restricted areas uh, where they have the classrooms and the radar equipment to make sure they're extra security. Uh, you are not taking your tech book home to the barracks to study. Um, you are doing that in, in the classroom. This is a view of the, from the north end of the camp looking south, you've got that uh, the railroad freight area there in the foreground. Uh, you can see some of the buildings all you know scattered about. Um, you know, they're not lined up perpendicular to the road. There are many of them are at a little odd angles uh, to work with the terrain. Uh, you can see kind of the hospital area that's one of the largest cleared out areas and tabled off areas up at the top, which is why the Australian pines moved in in large numbers at the end of the war. Uh, here is the middle part of the camp. That's US-1. There's still two lanes in the foreground. Uh, we're looking west. That kind of, that road there that makes that, you know, sharp 90 degree turn is still there today. You've got camp, uh, you've got park residences along that. Um, that, so when you make that kind of turn in the middle there, running past the large buildings, that kind of bare patch kind of left of center, that's going to be Hope Mountain today. Um, You'll see a range of the, the classroom buildings there, kind of left of Hope Mountain. Uh, you'll see some of these arched buildings that almost look like barns. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those when I get to the uh, some of the radar that they were training with, but that was to hide the, especially made buildings to hide the radar antennas. Um, and then this is the south end of camp. Uh, you've got the, the hospital again there at the, the end where the campground is today. The hospital gate, kind of lower right uh, by US-1, that's now the main park entrance. Um, and past the railroad toward the top, you see some of the uh, the area where the water plant is, uh, water treatment plant is, and then the line there kind of going off in the woods is the line from the water treatment plant out to the north fork of the river to discharge the theoretically treated sewage from the camp. Um, Especially with the inlet being closed during the war, the treatment was not as effective as they really would have liked, and there were some water quality issues in the river during the war. And you can also see in this, you really get a sense of the layout of the camp in terms of the, the natural topography, the varied scrub here, um, dotted with patches from old agricultural fields, and then a lot of just oddly shaped little wetlands and depression marshes um, caused by the rolling terrain. This is the Camp Murphy main gate that I mentioned. Um, like I said, the second the second built camp, uh, second gate north, uh, not the main gate anymore today at the park, but the old the gate during the war. This is the Southern Signal Corps School headquarters with the uh, conveniently captioned right there on the building for us. You can see even the school headquarters is just tar paper on the outside. They have landscaped it quite nicely. You can see the paved roads as well there. Um, this included uh, Colonel Ord's office inside the uh, building, and we step inside here to his office. You can see his nameplate back there on the desk, and uh, again, you know, bare walls here with the slat board. Uh, just a little bit about our some of our commanding officers there. You have Hugh Mitchell, the colonel uh, at the start of the camp. Uh, in the middle, you've got Albert Cox and James Ord, and then James Green on the right-hand side. Uh, you have a little bit of a, uh, a complicated structure of the uh, camp being set up because you have the post, which manages the infrastructure, uh, the training regiment that manages the students, and then the school, which manages the training. Uh, this is a little complicated and unwieldy. It will be combined later between the post and the school being under a single commander. And... Okay, a slide out of order here.
bear with me for a moment here. Okay. So this is looking more or less south from Oho Mountain. These are some of the classroom buildings here. Um, you can see the chimneys. Uh, they have some heat for the winter, but also for uh, burning confidential documents that they didn't want to get out. Um, the lone surviving uh, two-story building here that's now a park residence will be somewhere up toward the upper right portion of this photo. Um, it's I think one of the other buildings is kind of blocking part of the view toward that building, um, just because it, unless it was reoriented, reoriented at a later date. Um, and of course, remember, this is uh, South Florida scrub, and it's no air conditioning back then in these buildings, not really even any insulation uh, from the bare bones construction. So during the summer, they tried to have classes very early or very late in the day. Uh, another one of those radar buildings I mentioned on the upper left there to hide the radars, antennas. Uh, this is a look more toward the west. Uh, that park road is still there. You can see a truck pulling out from a, the other park road um, that's otherwise obscured by the trees. Uh, one of the chapels, some of the warehouses. This is the railroad station, uh, which seems to have been repurposed from a uh, existing railroad station called Likely, very unlikely name. Uh, it was, which is the whole freight station there for uh, a whole flag stop for some of the farmers in the area dating back to the early days of the railroad. Uh, as best we can tell, and uh, someone may be able to correct me on this who's on this talk, I uh, would think it was just north of the park, what's now the park road on the right hand side. There's kind of a little tabled off area right there that would seem to fit the railroad station. Um, here is a shot of what one of the barracks looks like. Again, you know, bare tar paper, uh, got the building number there in the upper right, uh, the T for being temporary. Someone's on mess duty here and judging by the guy looking over him, maybe in a spot of trouble. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the shot taken by one of the men stationed here. He, um, his camera turned up on eBay uh, for a collector along with some other Camp Murphy items. And it turned out he had a bunch of undeveloped film negatives from his time at the camp, uh, which have uh, been digitized and uh, the collector of that was Skip Gladwin and Gracious. So he had an amazing collection of Camp Murphy stuff he donated to us. Uh, and then here's the inside of what one of the barracks has looked like. You got the uniforms hanging, you got all the cots, the uh, stoves there for some heat. Uh, somebody camera shy, hiding under a newspaper. So this is uh, the flow chart for students coming into the camp. Now, in theory, before you got to Camp Murphy, you have been selected for radio training ability. Um, ideally, you had pre-war experience with electronics, or you were a ham radio operator, or had worked with commercial radio or something. Uh, there are people who had zero pre-war experience with radio, and they simply tested into it. Uh, I talked to someone at a previous time I gave this talk, and they were a farm boy from the Midwest, never touched a radio in their life, but... They had the, they, they tested into it and whatever the World War II equivalent of was of an ASVAB and um, successfully passed the course and worked in radio and uh, radar during World War II. Uh, so you're going to have to make sure that you understand how radio works as a principle, work on the actual radio equipment. Then once you understand radio, then you can understand radar. Then you have to, after you've passed radar, then you can finally be trained in the end goal, which was being able to not just operate it, but also make a repair and maintain the radar. And remember, you're going to be sent to the deserts of North Africa and varied terrain in uh, Europe, and of course, the inhospitable tropical climates of the Pacific. So you're dealing with a wide range of equipment and uh, places you might have to work on this stuff. And it is the new cutting age technology. This is the era of vacuum tubes. This is not something easy for people to pass. The, the failure rate was very high. Um, this is one of those, you know, you know, when you're starting of class, look to the guy left and right of you, only one of the three of you will be here. Uh, and even that may have been an optimistic prediction on some of this. Um, so I mentioned the post manages the infrastructure. You've got the supply and service department with the headed by a quartermaster or repairs and utilities department headed by a post engineer. There's the medical department that runs the hospital. 
And then there's the special service department that is responsible for recreation and morale. Uh, the 801st Signal Training Regiment that handles the student personnel. They've got a headquarters company, a security company, and at the peak size, 25 companies divided into five battalions. Uh, and again, maybe most of, there was rarely you know 25 companies at full strength at any given time. A lot of those will be you know on paper only for a little while. The school has its own supply department, a security department, because every student had to have secret clearance to work on radar. Um, I believe the, I can't remember if this is Ord's words or one of the uh, the pamphlets that uh, related to the camp, but the goal is to learn how to keep radar sets working all the time under any conditions. Um, all students, in theory, students are getting some preliminary training, especially in radio, at some colleges or other training sites around the country before they get to Camp Murphy. Uh, but no matter how little or how much training that they will have had before they get to the camp, they will at minimum get a refresher course uh, once they get to the camp just to make sure their previous training was up to snuff. Um, and then from there, once they are, they will go into one of three specialty courses. You've got, um, first you go into the pre-radar department, you're getting pre-radar and radar components. Uh, then you get into reporting, you can go into the then either the reporting engineer, excuse me, the reporting equipment department, which handles long range radars and small transportable radars. So they've been at some little small, like almost backpack uh, radars at the time. Um, the arched buildings I mentioned are, were specially designed for the SCR 270 antenna uh, for one type of the radar. Uh, they have wooden arches 50 feet tall in the center. They had to be uh, specially fabricated from lumber in Washington State, shipped by railroad down here. Uh, you have a separate airborne equipment department. Um, that is people who are going to be served because this is Air Force is still part of the Army at this time. It's the Army Air Forces. So they are servicing um, air to ground search radars for certain bombers and uh, reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, then you have the gun lane equipment department. That is, you know, there's one type of radar that says, okay, there's a plane out there. It's coming this way. It's at this height. Uh, but then there is the actual gun lane radar that is guiding anti-aircraft guns to shoot at the plane that your other radar has told you you're up there. Uh, so someone, you will go on one of these three tracks, be trained in one or two different types of radar in there. Uh, and, and this was something I understand Colonel Ord wanted to stress uh, that this was the radar maintenance is the end goal. You know, they can make something out of people if they can handle the radar without getting be able to handle the maintenance, but that was really what they wanted to do. Um, if you couldn't handle the operation, they could direct you into electrician rigor work, uh, particularly for the fixed radar antenna stations. Uh, if you handled the operation, but not the maintenance, you could potentially be used as an operator for fixed stations. Uh, most of the student graduates that are coming out are going to go into what was called a technician rank, um, fifth, fourth or third class. These are the equivalent to corporal sergeant or staff sergeant. Uh, but the idea, they was, were used during World War II because they signified some kind of specialty training as opposed to general leadership training that the other ranks would have. Uh, but they're, they're equivalent on that level. Uh, basically the same, in fact, the same shoulder insignia, but with a T added. Uh, here are some of what the radar textbooks looked like. Uh, some amusing designs here, uh, climbing climbing the levels of technology to understand it. Uh, some of these textbooks are quite thick. Uh, these are very advanced. I'm, I couldn't begin to pass this class myself. Um, here's the gun example of gun lane, gun lane radar. This is, I believe, a, a, a Army Signal Corps official photo from you know, training out somewhere in the desert or maybe North Africa. Um, here is the early warning radar. This is a, a stock photo on the right, uh, but that's what they use the buildings for there. I've mentioned with the arched roof. Uh, then you got a classroom building in front of it. Uh, and then this is part of the airborne equipment department there, and that's why they've got the airplane. They don't have any kind of airfield here at the uh, at the camp, uh, this plane did not fly. There's no engines on it, but you need to be able to physically, you know, work on on the radar where it would be, you know, in and out of a, a no fuselage and the nose of a of a bomber. So they had them, uh, you know, non-operational models to work on. 
Uh, and then the latter part of the war, as the radar needs are being met, they have some heavy signal construction battalions in 1944, um, five of these that have been retrained from other, or are being retrained from other uses in the army. Like one of them was a barrage battalion, barrage balloon battalion down in Panama. Um, they are brought into Camp Murphy to be trained on doing communications infrastructure repairs in Europe uh, in, in the latter part of the war. Um, they will, they need a 12 week training course um, they will work on pole line construction training west of the railroad tracks. Um, some of these, most of these units came in with really bad morale and leadership issues. Uh, Org talks about in his memoirs of having to basically gut the leadership of most of these units uh, and, and kind of rebuild them, with, especially with people who not only had leadership skills for a, a, a unit being you know, potentially threatened with combat or near combat situations, um, but also had the technical savvy to be able to uh, handle, you know, command the work being done. Um, one of the great stories that we learned about recently is, and I apologize, I forget this lady's name. Um, a woman contacted me that had, she'd grown up out by Indian town and she lived on a farm. Her dad, you know, avoided, didn't have to go into the service because he had a, a, a critical job of cutting uh, railroad ties for the railroads. Uh, but they lived on a whole farm right outside Indian Town, and their farm is surrounded by timberland owned by the Southern States Land and Timber Company. And she says, you know, there were these guys that would come from Camp Murphy, and they would show up on a you know Monday. They would set up a bunch of uh, you know communications poles, like telephone poles or something. They'd string lines, and then by the end of the week, they'd take all this stuff down and pack up their camp and leave. And then the next week. Some other guys from Camp Murphy would show up and they'd repeat this process all over again. I know she just she, she knew of Camp Murphy, but she just didn't understand what she had seen as a child. And you know, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" Because you were describing this heavy signal construction battalion training, and and thanks to your you know firsthand account, we now know that they were doing field training out by Indian Town about this. Um, some of the letters from some of the other soldiers that were working in the radar training also talk about how they were occasionally. You know, told, okay, pack up in the middle of the night. We're driving out to the Everglades. You're going to set up this, you know, unit, your radar unit in the field and make it work. You know, show us that you've, you can do this in a, in a real situation. Um, so it was great to see that this was something they were doing with the heavy signal construction training as well. Uh, besides the, the technical work of radar and, and signals infrastructure, um, you also have the, you know, survive the war training. Uh, concurrent with this, they have obstacle courses at the camp. There'll be se separate obstacle courses for officers and uh, enlisted men. Uh, there's a gun range down in the southern part of the park west of the railroad. Uh, sadly, when they set up the uh, Jonathan Dickinson missile tracking annex in the 1980s, they ran a fenced enclosure for a communications cable out to a boreside antenna, and they ran it right through the middle of this firing line. Um, so destroying a little bit of history out there. This is a really inaccessible part of the park. Um, it's a sensitive sand pine scrub. So uh, there's not really, you have to slog through a lot of sugar sand to get there legally. Uh, so you have different three different firing lines depending on what kind of guns you're shooting. There is a primary target line and then they oriented it. So there was a very large sand ridge behind it. So if you shot through anything or over anything, it wasn't going to go flying too far. It was going to impact on the the sand ridge behind it um post-war this would actually be used by reserve training the marines the national guard um for a couple decades afterwards until the 1970s when it was determined that they were kind of making a mess and tearing up the scrub and leaving their trash behind and that was uh, that practice was ended <laughs> um but so you've got some machine gun training here with m2 brownings uh, this originally they were just training with carbines, pistols, and submachine guns, and then they added the the machine gun training in 1943, and then uh, also the uh, heavy signal construction battalions in 44 did some training with machine with uh, grenades as well. So this is looking from the range down there at the targets and the uh, embankment. Uh, and they've got the infiltration course here. You got people, you know, crawling around explosions under barbed wire. Um, 
people shooting over top of them. You know, it's one thing to shoot a gun or have you know have a shot gun shot in your direction. It's another thing to have bullets you know flying over your head and making sure you're not going to panic in the heat of the moment. So uh, these guys, fortunately, did not have with radar. Usually, did not have to deal that with that uh, in out in combat. But you'd rather have them prepared for something they don't have to do than put them in that situation combat situation because the front line got overrun and uh, better be prepared. Um, here's the uh, shot of the obstacle course that showed up in the newspaper. Like I said, the only thing that we were keeping secret was exactly what kind of technology they were working on. Um, there were also, uh, besides the optical courses and uh, obstacle courses and the gun ranges, uh, there were some slip trenches and machine gun nests dug around the camp, um, used for some uh, training uh, and for cases of emergency, you know, no, they didn't know what was going to happen in the war. They'd rather be prepared that someone somehow attacked the camp, um, U-boat commandos or who knows what might happen. Um, there was at some point in the war a radar, according to according to Colonel, Colonel Ord, a radar was placed on the east side of a hill, presumably Hogue Mountain, because that was certainly the best hill, and modified to track offshore shoreline targets, which were then reported to the Navy's Gulf Sea Frontier headquarters in Miami. Um, most of the training here at the camp was done by Army Signal Corps. Um, going into either you know staying in the army ground forces or some of it going to uh the army air force but there were about 600 marine corps students that also went through the camp to train on radar because the marines need radar too um the, during the peak of training in 1943 there were uh, morning midday and evening shifts although during the summer they really tried to avoid the uh the midday shifts and uh, do early early and late training in the day um, there were a lot of civilian workers here. These are mostly people that were living in the area um, and spouses of people working at the camp. Um, in the back there, you'll see a tall guy with glasses. That is John Du Bois for local residents. He's the guy who ran the Du Bois Fish Camp. Um, he worked in the uh, engineering department because he was a handyman. Um, three of his kids worked at the camp in various roles. And his uh, wife, Bessie, uh, baked pies for the camp. Then he would bring them in. She would get up really early to bake pies, and he would bring them in for the, uh, the cafeteria on his way into work every morning. And this is the supply depot, uh, supply department. Uh, as you can see, they did have black. There were no black soldiers at Camp Murphy. There were black civilian workers. Um, handling a lot of handling labor and things like that. Um, women a lot of times being in secretarial roles during World War II at the camp. Uh, and then you had, you know, support roles for things like, you know, these are some of these guys are very young. They are, you know, if you've been to college, think about what the, the people struggled with first time away from home at college and you know, then transplant that over to, you know, first time away from home and now you're in the army. Um, so th simple things sometimes like mending clothes. Uh, so you have women, local women from civic groups helping out with, you know, sewing circles for the men at the camp, things like that. Uh, and this is inside one of the camp buildings. Uh, one of the larger ones, too, because you can see how much of the, of the background there is. Um, for recreation over on Jupiter Island, the Jupiter Island Club was converted into a officer's club. Uh, for the enlisted men, you had the, and that's what's depicted in the postcard. Um, for the enlisted men, you had the Umbrella Canteen, which was uh, another temporary building built on the beach dunes uh, in the picture in the lower left there. Uh, and right by the Umbrella Canteen was the designated GI Beach for the enlisted men. Um, they quite enjoyed the the beach there at Jupiter Island. Um, when the uh, there's a tanker that is uh, the Gulfland that collides with another tanker in the later part of '43 and drifts up on the beach and burns for weeks, and uh, shows up in the letters of a number of Camp Murphy soldiers as well, uh, writing home about things happening down here. Uh, besides the beachfront, uh, oh, and this is the this is GI Beach. Uh, you got they've got a basketball court, a volleyball court, and you've got lifeguards back there on the beach with people swimming. Um, and then uh, the Ford Estate on Jupiter Island 
opened up their swimming pool to the GIs. And in some cases, these kids were learning to swim. Uh, young men were learning to swim for the first time. That was a lot of guys that uh, had grown up in you know places that away from the ocean just simply had never learned to swim. And you know, if your ship gets torpedoed while it's being sent somewhere, you'd really like to not drown. Um, the camp produced uh, two newspaper, uh, a newsletter early in the war, and then later a uh, newspaper. Um, and the newsletter, about, they were produced about every two to three days. It, they would skip a day if it, landed, if it was an issue was going to land on Sunday. Um, there were about 220 issues that we, uh, that we can know were produced. Sadly, very because these are you know one page printed both sides mimeographed, these do not have a very high survival rate as far as we can tell. There's only about there's only twelve issues that we've found surviving copies um, through donations or, or collection holdings of uh, museums. Uh, the newspaper, which starts up in the latter half of the war, uh, those had a much higher survival rate because they were you know full size newspapers. There were a couple special issues at the anniversary of the camp and as the the camp's closing down. Out of 52 issues of the newspaper, there are 40 of them that we have found a copy, complete copy of. Uh, I've tried to track down as many of these as I can from any source I can find, just so we can, you know, gather what was going on at the camp, the life, and the you know names of soldiers who were stationed there. Um, haven't had a chance to really comb through them as well as I'd like for all the details, but they are they're instrumental source of um, information. And I see from my notes actually. Um, I'm going to back up here for a moment. So more, a little bit more on Jupiter Island that I forgot to mention. Uh, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so there is a there was a ferry that operated two ferry boats going back and forth between the mainland and Jupiter Island. Um, Brady Mitchell, who was a Jupiter Island resident, and he's a retired Army Coast Artillery Brigadier General. Um, Colonel Ord said he made us all welcome and introduced many of us to the other residents. Uh, many of the officers from Camp Murphy lived in winter estates on Jupiter Island. Uh, Joseph Reed, who had you know, basically started modern Jupiter Island uh, and the Hope Sound Company, um, he became the initial signal service officer for Camp Murphy. Uh, he talked many of the seasonal residents into, uh, you know, just stay, stay up north for the war. You know, do, do a solid one for, you know, the soldiers serving in the war effort. Stay up north and... Um, rent out your homes to officers at the camp and, um, you know, don't charge them what the house is worth, charge them, you know, a, a percentage relative to their rank and their pay. Um, so Colonel Ord and, and, and many of the, the other officers lived on the island. Um, besides what's on Jupiter Island, there are R&R options at the Stewart in West Palm Beach, Hope Sound, I should be Stewart and West Palm Beach had service clubs. Um, the Flagler Center in downtown Stewart was built as a service club during the war. Um, there is a USO club established in Hope Sound at Wilson, what was then Wilson Palm Gardens. Uh, part of that building is actually still there today on Old Dixie Highway, south of Bridge Road. Uh, the Jupiter Women's Club Clubhouse in Jupiter is also used as a USO club during the war. Um, and then there on Palm Beach Island, there's a V for Victory Canteen there. And if you didn't want to swim at the uh, Jupiter Island, uh, you had the Palm Beach had some great beaches as well. And um, there are Lido Pools, which is a tourist attraction kind of on right at the east end of Worth Avenue on Palm Beach Island. A lot of the swimming competitions uh, between the different service groups uh, were held there as well as recreational swimming. So guys get trained. Um, They've, the war is getting to a point where you know there is an end in sight. They have enough people trained in radar. They have this the signal corps uh, the construction battalion guys trained, and so in late '44 the school begins closing down uh, officially as an army camp. It is closed in November 30th, 1944. Uh, the camp is still there. There's you know kind of caretakers to to manage the infrastructure that's left behind. Um, there will be in 1945, some of the uh, the War Food Administration and the War Manpower Commission will use the camp buildings, particularly the barracks uh, and mess halls, for foreign labor repatriation. Uh, 
during the war, because so many men are in the service, you know, there's a shortage of laborers for agriculture, especially at harvest time, and for some in, for some more industry. Um, so they bring in Caribbean laborers on 90-day work visas, uh, including in the Bahamas, Jamaica, Barbados, and Honduras. Um, once the 90-day visas are up, you know, especially as the war is winding down and, and men are starting to trickle home and the war industry is less of an issue, um, it's time to ship these guys back home and shipping is tight uh, still during the war. Um, sometimes these guys have a rather extended stays. They get kind of antsy. They're sitting around with nothing to do in this old army camp. Uh, or, well, he's not old at this point, but um, sitting around with nothing to do uh, to buy their time. They get bored. They get restless. Um, some of the different nationalities uh, did not get along with one another. Um, people are anxious to return home to their families. These are all, uh, you know, younger men. Um, the WMA and WMC will then will be cited for a lack of management and security and insufficient, not providing custodial services, garbage pickup, and generally not running the camp real well. Um, all these conditions lead to tensions including some fights and a small riot. Uh, there are buildings that are destroyed by arson. Um, it's, it is a very tense situation that is eventually uh, sorted out. I don't think anybody died in all of this, thankfully. Um, once, you know, 1946, all the foreign labor situation has been uh, resolved. And now it's this, the war is over. This is one of very many wartime military installations that is time for the federal government to dispose of. So the War Assets Administration sells off most of the buildings. Uh, it was, you know, put it on a moving truck, get it on a barge, or disassemble it and take it away. You know, just don't leave it here. Um, there are almost a thousand buildings of a wide variety of sizes and uses in the camp. Um, you know, some of them are, are destroyed or removed for whatever reason during the war or the immediate aftermath with the uh, labor unrest. Uh, but there's still a lot to be disposed of. Uh, some of these are given away to Palm Beach County, Martin County, and St. Lucie County schools that ask for them. One goes to the Palm Beach County Crippled Children's Society Clinic. Uh, one, at least one becomes uh, part of the prison stockade for low-risk convict labor in Palm Beach County. The University of Miami takes the sewage disposal plant equipment um, some of the, you know, some of the buildings were concrete, but the wooden buildings and the equipment they took away, uh, various municipalities acquired buildings, the Florida Sanitarium and Hospital got some, the two chapels became Saint, the original St. Joseph Catholic Church in Stewart and the Fort Pierce Baptist Church. Sadly, both of those churches would be later destroyed by unrelated fires. Um, the former PX building was uh, taken apart and put back together in Stewart on the waterfront to make Whitaker Boat Works. It is still there today. They also made a cottage that they converted from an officer's latrine. Um, the Riverside Company of Fort Pierce acquires some buildings. Um, the U.S. Navy and Morrison Field down there in West Palm Beach take some of them. The Joint Army-Navy Experimental and Testing Board takes a bunch of the buildings to use for you know, testing various demolitions and explosives to see how they work. Uh, one goes to Stewart to be a Red Cross building uh, after the Red Cross moves on to better uh, better building later on. Uh, that building will fall into disrepair, but then get moved and restored as the Road to Victory Museum that's still there in downtown right behind the courthouse in Stewart. Uh, the Hope Sound Civic Center or Community Center, which got a photo of that one. Um, Oh, here's the, the church from a postcard shortly after the war. This is the St. Joseph Catholic Church. Um, the Hope Sound Community Center is a former Camp Murphy building. Um, we've also got several buildings right on Bridge Road that are the Diamond Garage um, and a couple other buildings there. Uh, the still intact, uh, have been repurposed for various uses. Some have been modified. Uh, there was just a uh, little coffee shop in, up at Jensen Beach that in the with the park in the news, they mentioned that their building, which is by the looks of it from Google Street View, has been pretty heavily altered. But their building is a former Camp Murphy building. Um, the photo at the bottom is a former cottage on uh, East Ocean Boulevard in Stewart that has been cut in half and, you know, part of it turned perpendicular to the road and the uh, storage 
room built in front of part of it, but that's another building. Uh, there's a couple houses scattered in the Olympia neighborhood um, south of Beach, uh, south of Ridge Road in Hope Sound that appear to be former Camp Murphy buildings. There's a number of times I, you know, just driving around town, I go, hmm, I wonder when I see some of these buildings. Uh, there are remnants of Camp Murphy in the park. Uh, there is Building 18 as you go up toward Hope Mountain Tower. It's now Park Ranger, Ranger Residence. It was a former classroom building. That's what's pictured on the left. Uh, the water treatment plant, the concrete portions of it are still there on the west side of the railroad. There are a number of other concrete uh, fire safety, fire safe vaults for storing literature and, and things like that securely and uh, away from fire for you know, wooden buildings in the brush. Um, those concrete portions of buildings and concrete foundations of other buildings have survived. A lot of the buildings, especially the barracks, were not on concrete foundations. They were just on little concrete pilings. Um, there is a bank vault uh, over by Old Dixie Highway, north of the Park Road that is, is still there. The, the rest of the building with the bank for the bank is gone, but the vault is still there. Um, foundations of some of the buildings along the Park Road, along Old Dixie Highway. Uh, there are a lot of disturbed areas where you can very easily identify them when you're walking through them or from a, an aerial photo where you just things aren't growing well, real well. Um, the scrub is slow growing to begin with, and then some of these areas being disturbed by asphalt roads or especially the freight area with all the coal that they had there, the coal dust affecting the soil. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of bits of it. This is, you know, why people were, you know, recently thinking that this could be, oh, it's just a derelict army camp. We could just turn it into a golf course. That's that's why they're, you know, getting this thinking. Um, here's another uh, foundation really be kind of reclaimed by the uh, the scrub in the lower right. Uh, one of the manhole covers for the sewer system in the upper right. Um, and one of the building foundations that the barracks used to sit on, and some of them have been repurposed as plugs for the, uh, the sewer access where the manhole has, middle manhole has broken or gone missing. Um, on the right is what the North Water Vault, or excuse me, on the left is North Water Vault uh, with a building in front of it that's also from Camp Murphy. Um, for those of you who were at the talk yesterday, you would learn that this is the Baker Nun Station from the Cold War for a camera for tracking satellites. Um, been repurposed and uh, sadly now in pretty bad state of decay. Um, something I would personally really like to, to see that unique double part of history, Camp Murphy and Baker Nunn, see that preserved and interpreted in some way. Um, there are two other water vaults. One is the, the quote unquote bunker for Bunker Hill, um, briefly tested for civil defense in the 60s, but uh, only briefly tried out and then abandoned ever since. Uh, and then the South Bunker was, uh, South Water Vault became a civil defense uh, emergency operations center uh, and then nowadays is used by the park since the 80s uh, for their offices and, and storage and so forth. Um, this presentation would not be possible without the efforts of a lot of people. Um, Barry Richardson and Dick Roberts, now both retired from the Florida Park Service. Uh, Barry is responsible for getting that historical marker put up for Camp Murphy at the Hope Mountain parking lot. He also got the uh, kiosk that was put up there that was a very nice little interpretation panel about the park which someone sadly drove into earlier this year which will hopefully get fixed up and replaced um, in the near future. Uh, a lot of key information from firsthand accounts from Colonel Ord. Uh, his memoirs are beyond invaluable uh, as well as his color photography and the reminiscences of his wife Sarah uh, and his um, contributions from his two daughters. Uh, have been a big part in helping to understand what happened with the camp uh, and their effort, willingness to share with uh, the Historical Society and with the State Park. Um, Skip Gladwin, uh, who has sadly passed away, he was a very active, uh, um, devoted collector of local history, amassed probably one of the, probably the largest collection of private Camp Murphy material, uh, not in the hands of a Camp Murphy veteran. Um, the, the State Park does have Camp Murphy material in their archives from Ord and from other sources, camp veterans who would write into the park with reminiscences and photos and things like that. Um, our Historical Society has a collection as well from a variety of sources. 
Uh, I still watch eBay like a hawk. When I see a photo on there, or I see a, a collection of letters from someone at the camp. I am windmill slamming that thing. Um, when I have time, I want to go through just a lot of World War II oral history that's available and has been digitized from all sorts of places around the country uh, at various museums and things and just find people who are at Camp Murphy and you know sometimes they have a sentence about the camp and sometimes they have more to say but just kind of collect that and collect names I'm trying to build a roster of everyone who's at Camp Murphy um, as best I can tell the National Archives sadly has very little about Camp Murphy um, so I've been trying to comb through what little they do have and some muster rolls that have survived and, and, and correspondence and the newspapers and things like that. Anytime someone's mentioned as a Camp Murphy veteran or at Camp Murphy to add them to a database, um, it's going to be an appendix to a book someday to, to be an honor roll for these guys. Probably 20,000 men went through this camp and uh, hundreds of other civilians. Um, and you know, probably up two or 3,000 of them. So I've, I've been able to identify so far. It's an ongoing process. Um, the dedication photos, randomly, the George C. Marshall Foundation has them. Um, the, the newspapers, uh, the newsletter and newspaper have been a great source of material and more. There's a lot more information to mine from those and just, you know, combing through Palm Beach Post, Stewart News and other local newspapers to, to see what they say about the camp. 